Fascism and right-wing extremism is on the rise all over the world. Fascists have committed atrocities. They're running for office, and in some countries, they are already in power. Here in the United States, we've seen on January 6th, Trump supporters and fascists take over the Capitol at the behest of one of their leaders. While so far they've mostly faced repercussions for their actions, it's very important for the left to think about how we will combat it and how to prevent as much harm as possible to the best of our abilities. As we know from history, the consequences for not recognizing the fascist threat are dire, which is what we are learning about today. Understanding how the left failed to prevent Nazism from coming to power in Germany can reveal a lot about how we should prepare for and how to stop the future before it happens. In the 1920s, Germany was the Weimar Republic and was run as a parliamentary democracy. After Germany's defeat at the end of World War I in 1918, the reins of the government were handed over to the Social Democratic Party. The SPD was handed an enormous amount of problems to resolve, namely the economic depression from the enormous debt for paying all of the damages done in World War I. Those damages weren't paid until 2010, so this task was impossible at the time. There was also a fragmented society left over. Germans were upset to not only have lost the war, but that their government wasn't alleviating the growing poverty that many Germans found themselves in. This led many to funnel out into joining more radical groups. Before the Nazis, the Communist Party of Germany, the KPD, was the go-to to address rage against the government. The Communist Party did see a surge in membership after the war, becoming the second largest political party in Germany, but another group was beginning to spring up that would funnel the rage. Many disgruntled war feds did end up joining the KPD, but quite a few had the perspective that Germany lost the war due to internal enemies, namely the communists and the Jews. This stark contrast is most evident in the communist revolt that established the brief Munich Republic of 1919. Communists and anarchists together overthrew the SPD government and operated through democratic workers' councils, a sort of network of unions. It was crushed via a combination of the SPD police and military, as well as the Freikorps, a nationalist right-wing militia made up of war vets. Groups like the Freikorps sprang up, murdering communists and SPD officials. From the very beginning, right-wing violence was slowly taking over the streets of Germany, a precondition for the development of the Nazi brown shirts. Violence also came in the form of state repression of the SPD military and police. Two more communist uprisings were attempted in 1921 and 1923, both quashed by the Social Democrats, as well as slaughtering several striking union workers all throughout the 1920s. In some cases, some battles with the workers' unions used artillery. The government war on breaking up unions also resulted in systemic firing of known communists in the workplace. As unemployment grew, the communists were now driven to switch from agitating in the workplace to the streets. The agitation in public spaces was nothing new for the KPD. They've used it for protests, insurrection, and elections. Some neighborhoods were made up of entire voting blocks for the communists, and many pubs were welcoming to them. What was new was direct confrontation with the Nazis, who were all too happy for the opportunity to crack some communist skulls. As unemployment rose and wages decreased across the nation, street battles were becoming more frequent. The brown shirts would go after any Jew and any communist they could get their hands on, who in their minds were the same people. Many were killed, but the communists fought back. The KPD formed the Anti-Fascist Action and the Red Fighters League, and united with some SPD workers. They would come together to drive out Nazis at Nazi-sympathetic bars. They would have street patrols to be on the lookout for brown shirt activity, preventing Nazi murders and saving Jewish lives. At its height, they had 127,000 active anti-fascists. Anarchists also brushed up against the Nazis. The Free Workers' Union of Germany took seriously the fascist threats to the lives of everyone in the country. Unlike the anarchists, the KPD leadership didn't see it that way. When the anti-fascists kicked out Nazis from pubs and fought them in the streets, the KPD publicly denounced their actions because it didn't follow the party line. 
The KPD not taking the threat of Nazism seriously was for a couple of reasons. One was that in the beginning, fascists were a very minor group in the German political world. The Nazi party have very few members, and after the disastrous coup Hitler led, the Beer Hall Push, the communists brushed them off as just reactionaries letting off some steam due to economic anxiety. They were also more concerned with fermenting revolution, as Russia toppled its monarchy and parliament and created the first socialist state. All over Europe socialists were excited for the revolutions, and the KPD was no exception. Throughout the 1920s, the communists were expecting a revolution happening any year. But with the failures of Munich, the 1921-1923 uprisings, the working class wasn't seeing it happening. This leads into what the KPD called the Third Period. In 1928, Stalin became the prime leader of the USSR, and in turn dictated to all communist parties allied with the Soviet Union that they were entering a third period of revolution. The third period essentially required that parties separate themselves entirely from working with social democrats and create themselves a party ready for revolution. However, this was an entirely flawed strategy because the majority of workers were aligned with the SPD and SPD unions, thus the KPD chose to totally alienate themselves from the majority of the working class. This wasn't a completely unwarranted plan. As I mentioned earlier, the SPT government had fought and killed many communists with cops and the military, and KPD were allied with the Soviet Union from its very beginning. Famous heads of the party like Ernst Stallman ingratiated themselves with the party and gradually pushed the party to do whatever the Soviet government demanded of them. KPD members were awarded to visit Moscow and take part in its education, children were sent to trips to the USSR, and even some members trained in the Red Army. In turn, the Soviet Union provided funding and direction, and Soviet and German unions would exchange whatever they needed with each other. The KPD by the late 20s was completely integrated into the Soviet's diplomatic system, but this would ultimately lead to its destruction with the introduction of the theory of social fascism. Social fascism was an idea cooked up by Stalin, in which he states that fascism is not only a military technical category, fascism is the bourgeoisie's fighting organization that relies on the active support of social democracy. Social democracy is, objectively, the moderate wing of fascism. There is no ground for assuming that the fighting organization of the bourgeoisie can achieve decisive successes in battles or in governing the country without the active support of social democracy. There is just as little ground for thinking that social democracy can achieve decisive successes in battles or in governing the country without the active support of the fighting organization of the bourgeoisie. These organizations do not negate but supplement each other. They are not antipodes, they are twins. Essentially, social fascism is the theory that social democrats will eventually give up to fascism because the wealthy will not let go of their power, and thus social democrats are actually the real fascists. Of course, the theory falls flat on its face when you realize that Italy was literally a fascist state by the early 20s and both communists and social democrats were murdered and their parties banned. But the Communist Party ran with it, focusing more on criticizing the SPD rather than facing the Nazis, whose vote count at this point was running in more than 800,000 voters. This created a lot of division within the party among the workers, who correctly understood what a true threat the Nazis were. There was always tension with the working members and leadership of the KPD, starting with the leadership complaining that workers were spending too much time getting involved in their communist football clubs, bicycling clubs, choirs, and rock collecting clubs. But when the third period arrived, open criticism of the leadership was punishable by expulsion. Any sort of criticism levied at the leadership, as Soviet orders, colluding with social democrats, whether it was fighting Nazis in the streets or supporting democrats in elections, and criticism of Stalin would get you banned from the party. KPD leadership attempted many immature tactics to get their chapters in line, such as sending speakers to local chapters and having them lecture for hours and hours, 
until the chapter agreed to the leadership's proposals. The mass purging of party members and entire chapters hurt the KPD greatly, losing much of its base and distancing themselves from the tired and hopeless working class. In 1932, the last parliamentary election was run. The SPD decided to back the Christian conservative von Hindenburg, the KPD ran its candidate, and the Nazis had the third largest vote at 37%. When the Nazis lost the election, both the Social Democrats and Communists thought they would try to do a coup to take over the government, which would be crushed by the police and the government would make Nazism illegal. Instead, President Hindenburg offered the chancellorship to Adolf Hitler. The Nazis won some other cabinet positions, but still held a minority in the majority conservative government. They expected they would have to wait until the next elections to do anything significant, but the Reichstag, the main parliament's building, was set on fire in 1933. The fire was done by communist Marinus van der Lubbe, and this gave an excuse for the Nazis to exercise their creation of their police state with the passing of the Reichstag Fire Decree and later the Enabling Act, giving Hitler dictatorial powers. 36,000 communists mobilized to try to take the Nazis down, but were routed by Hitler's secret police, the Gestapo. Many of them were killed, most of them were the first people to populate the concentration camps. Some were able to elude the Nazis all throughout Hitler's reign, others fled out of the country. Many communists went eastward to the Soviet Union, where 60% of them were killed as victims of Stalin's Great Terror, and some were even deported by Soviet authorities right into the hands of the Gestapo. What can we learn from all this? Well, certainly fascism is and will always be the biggest threat to socialists everywhere and must be stopped no matter what. The biggest mistake the KBD made was simply not taking the Nazis seriously as a threat to themselves. Yes, they were seen as social outcasts in the beginning, but combining the Great Depression with a government that essentially stopped functioning, it was ripe for fascism to gain traction. If Nazis are actively hunting members of your party, I'd say that's more than enough reason to shift your focus to defending yourselves. While we don't have someone like Stalin dictating how working class institutions need to operate, the top-down Soviet-style formation of the KPD ultimately ruined the needs of the working class by replacing it with the aesthetic of Stalinist loyalty. This chain of command structure damages socialist organizations by sowing division among the membership, which is the last thing we need when fascism is on the rise. Being cemented in the Soviet system of doing things also prevented the party from adapting to new conditions of the country. The KPD used to be very popular among workers, but when the economy churned out millions of unemployed people, the KPD couldn't use the workplace as an avenue for organizing much longer. Yet, it still insisted on creating revolutionary cells and not changing its tactics simply because Stalin said so. When the economy has its inevitable downturn, socialists must be at the ready to serve the working class before the fascists exploit the situation. So what can we do to avoid the SPD and KPD's mistakes? Well, ex-Soviet socialist Leon Trotsky had some of the most keen insights on the rise of fascism at the time and his solution still holds a lot of water today. Trotsky proposed that the communists form an alliance with the Social Democrats in order to combat fascism. Still have separate organizations, but have mass actions and unions together in order to persuade the working class through spectacle, as well as draw support away from the Nazis. They would have joint committees in order to drive off Nazi marches and map Nazi headquarters and drive them away further. They would agree to defend each other's organizations and patrol streets together. They could even coordinate general strikes in each other's unions. And Trotsky leaves us with a warning. Worker communists, you are hundreds of thousands, millions. You cannot leave for any place. There are not enough passports for you. Should fascism come to power, it will ride over your skulls and spines like a terrific tank. Your salvation lies in a merciless struggle, and only fighting unity with the social democratic workers can bring victory. Make haste, worker communists. You have very little time left. 
Thank you for watching. This video took a while to make simply because of the sheer amount of research I had to do, but I felt it was really important to make. I decided to make this video more focused on socialists and communists because I often felt that they get left out of the conversation when talking about fascism, and it's crucial we learn from their mistakes so we don't make the same ones. I've linked below in the description to a lot of great videos that describe the rise of the Nazis if you want to see the other side of the coin of how fascism works. Next video might focus on anarchism in South Asia. If you found this video helpful, please donate to my Patreon so my student debt doesn't get in the way of telling the world about the people's history. Thanks again and Shalom!